it's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Other credit cards often charge annual fees for access to perks you might not even use or that can come with restrictions. Apple Card gives you valuable benefits without annual fees. In fact, there's not a single fee at all. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval. Variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.24% to 26.24% based on credit worthiness. Rates as of January 1st, 2023. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Other credit cards often charge annual fees for access to perks you might not even use or that can come with restrictions. Apple Card gives you valuable benefits without annual fees. In fact, there's not a single fee at all. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval. Variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.24% to 26.24% based on credit worthiness. Rates as of January 1st, 2023. The following podcast includes explicit language, including, well, you'll just have to wait and see. Hi, I'm Josh Levine, Slate's national editor, and this is Hang Up and Listen for the week of February 27th, 2023. On this week's show, Joseph Goodman of AL.com will be here to talk about the chaos and scandal surrounding the Alabama basketball program, where one player has been charged with murder and another is still playing despite allegedly bringing the murder weapon to the scene. We'll also be joined by Jeremy Wu for a conversation about his Sports Illustrated cover story on French basketball mega phenom Victor Wembanyama. And finally, Alex Sherman of CNBC will join us for a conversation about the possible death of regional sports networks and what comes next for sports on TV. I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm the author of The Queen and the host of the podcast One Year. Also in D.C. is Stefan Fatsis. He is the author of the books Word Freak, A Few Seconds of Panic, and Wild and Outside. Hello, Stefan. Hello, Josh. And in case you haven't heard why our friend Joel Anderson is taking a break from this show, Slate announced on Friday that Joel is going to host Slow Burn Season 8, which will be on the longest-serving justice on the U.S. Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas. We will miss Joel on Hang Up, but I'm very excited for what he is cooking up on Slow Burn. All right, Stefan. Week three of my continued (laughs) quest to fix the end of football games. Brian Fox of Charlottesville, listener, uh, wrote in to say that this idea of the automatic touchdown at the end of the game, that you could just, the defense could tell the offense, hey, it's time for you to score a touchdown now, and there's nothing the offense could do about it. He says that my comparison to the intentional walk is not quite correct, that it's more like the infield fly rule. He says it's a rule that says, in baseball, that the infield can't intentionally perform an action, dropping a ball that goes against the spirit of the game for a strategic advantage. So just laying that out there. And David Plotz of Washington, D.C., he says <laughs> that the rule should be that if the offense were to kneel down or even just to lose yards on a play, any negative play, any play where you lose yardage, the clock stops. He says that this is a small yet perfect change, that it requires the offense to take some sort of offensive action um, rather than just kneel on the ball. And I guess it also gives the defense a chance through superior execution, superior defensive play, to stop the offense and stop the clock and give itself a chance. Do you, Stephen Fatsis, agree that this is a small yet perfect change? There are loopholes here, like on a sack... What if the defense doesn't want the clock to stop? Do they have to decide whether they want the clock to stop or not? Maybe the defense is advantaged. Give them the option. Give them the option? Is that what uh, you're assuming? That's not what what David said, but I can speak for him. I'm his proxy. So you're refining Plotz's argument? (laughs) I am. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. I think that we would just see um, a lot more exciting um, butt pushes, the butt push quarterback sneak. Mm-hmm. would become that much more an intrinsic part of the game. I'm still a little hung up on the, like, if a running back is tackled for a loss of one yard on an offensive play. Re- rewarding the defense. Maybe rewarding the defense, maybe not rewarding the defense. I guess we're giving the option. But how do you convey that in the in the moment? 
keep the clock running. You have to make a little signal. You're allowed to take or, or not take a 10 second runoff. That that rule exists in uh, okay. 10 second football. runoff. So you're adjusting the clock and taking us out of the natural flow of the game artificially to account for this situation, which already happens. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're arguing. Are you concerned trolling? Are we going to get into concern trolling just, later I'm just in this thinking episode? through this. That's all. All right. Fine. You can think. You're allowed to think. If anybody else wants to write in, we can go into week four of this uh, of this debate uh, that only I seem to be engaged in. In our Slate Plus segment this week, we are going to look back at a weekend of buzzer beaters in basketball and evaluate what sport has the best endings. To hear us discuss that, you need to be a Slate Plus member. You get bonus segments on this and other Slate shows. You get ad-free shows and you get to support us, which we appreciate. Slate.com slash hangup plus to sign up. Slate.com slash hangup plus. Last month, Alabama basketball player Darius Miles and another man, Michael Lynn Davis, were charged with murdering 23-year-old Jamia Harris. Harris was out on what's known as the Strip in Tuscaloosa and was shot and killed in her car at around 1.45 a.m., allegedly by Davis with the Alabama player Miles' gun. In the aftermath of that tragedy, the Crimson Tide have kept on winning games and will likely be a number one seed in the men's NCAA tournament for the first time in program history. But early last week, as testimony began in the Capitol murder trial, police testified that two more Alabama players, freshman Jaden Bradley and Brandon Miller, were on the scene that night. One of them, Brandon Miller, reportedly got a text from his teammate, Darius Miles, that said, I need my joint. After getting that text, Miller brought Miles' car and gun to the scene just minutes before Jamia Harris was killed. And yet Miller, who's been projected as a top five pick in the NBA draft, has continued to play basketball for Alabama. Joining us now is Joseph Goodman. He's the lead sports columnist for AL.com, and he's been writing columns about this case for the last six weeks. Joe, thanks so much for coming on with us. You got it. Um, so we should be clear that Brandon Miller has not been charged with a crime. His lawyer has said that Miller never touched the gun and never knew that illegal activity involving the gun would occur. But Joe, you've written repeatedly that Miller should not be playing. And in your most recent column, you said that Alabama basketball now represents the corruption of values, the mismanagement of higher education, and the stripping away of senses that make us human. What led you to make that statement? I think that is the perception for a lot of people of Alabama basketball when it's viewed now through this lens of what has transpired in Tuscaloosa. And a lot of that, I think, stems from the team's reaction and specifically the head coach, Nate Oates's reaction to the, uh, the charges and to the incident. Most glaring, Oates said in a, at a news conference that, uh, that Miller was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and that's been perceived widely, and I think that's what led this to go national in a lot of ways, as just insensitive to the family of the victim and irresponsible as a coach who's supposed to be leading men, as they like to say. Right. And I spoke with the family of Harris, and after those initial statements on, Tuesday, on the Tuesday in question about Oates, and they were just extremely distraught by the flippant nature that he delivered those remarks. And he has since apologized in a statement and then after a previous game, sincerely apologized, he says. But that is kind of the beginning of where the loss of values, and I'm talking about the perception of integrity, has eroded for the University of Alabama and really in a large degree, college sports as a whole, because, you know, this this story now goes beyond Alabama, beyond even the United States. It's being covered internationally now. And a big reason why is because there are these values that have lost and it's it, this win at all costs mentality that kind of goes beyond athletics. So... The argument that the Alabama Athletic Department has made, I think, is that they're following law enforcement, right? That Miller and Bradley have not been charged with a crime. They were just considered witnesses that they didn't know about this text message. Um, do you find all of that 
believable that up to a certain point they were just kind of doing what they were told? Um, or do you feel like they should have, you know, if, with Nate Oates saying, we knew this all along, we knew that he was there, should they have acted much more quickly and not used this like we were just, you know, doing following law enforcement as an excuse? There have been several qualifiers throughout this process. So on the Tuesday when there was an initial bond hearing, okay, that is when the police detective in Tuscaloosa in the morning said that a text message was sent, okay? And a lot of this hinges um, on this text message, okay? Because before that, Alabama knew that Miller was involved, but they didn't know to the degree at which maybe he knew what was going on, okay? And the text message implicates that he knew that there was trouble taking place and that Miles needed a gun. And, and so immediately after that Tuesday bond hearing in the morning, there was a scheduled news conference for Alabama basketball, which is just a standard every week news conference, okay, before a game. And that was delayed for 45, for about 25 minutes. Um, and, and I can only presume that they were trying to get their story in order, okay? But at that point, that same morning is when Nate Oates initially said, Brandon Miller is, has done nothing wrong and and he's and we've determined that he's going to be playing okay and then th those are the comments that were taken as insensitive and hurtful and they were he also said that the decision to allow him and his teammate to play involved the athletic director and the president of the university and the obvious thing to ask is well you can't possibly know exactly what happened and wouldn't the prudent thing have been to take a deep breath have the player sit out until uh, a deeper investigation could be conducted either by the university or by law enforcement. And that didn't happen. And that seems, you know, and that's the, the aggravating thing here. They play, and I guess the first game was on the road in South Carolina and home over the weekend back in Alabama. What was the reaction of fans um, and what was the environment like? Well, at South Carolina, you know, there were a chance of guilty, guilty, guilty and lock him up. OK. And and then it began to snowball even more so at the home game this weekend when during player introductions, you know, there was the pat down of Brandon Miller as his name was being called and Alabama, the entire arena was cheering uh, in huge applause as support for him at the same time. Can you elaborate on that when you say the pat down? So player introductions have all of their customary rituals. This happens in the NBA and college and high school basketball. Uh, a player is introduced into the starting lineup before the game, and they go through a series of customary uh, you know, rituals that involve different type of pre-scripted routines. LeBron James, everyone from the kid and the on the JV sure. team, okay, do this. And one of Brandon Miller's rituals before the game was to have another player pat him down, okay? Like looking for a concealed weapon before going into a fight. Arms out like you're getting wanded or arms or out, right? Like you're getting frisked. Now, he's been doing this the entire season, okay? Uh and that is important to understand. But in the first home game, since he was implicated in a testimony by police, he was patted down for a weapon. And it was viewed as, and rightly so, as extremely just tone deaf and insensitive. Now, I need to clarify another point um, because it wasn't Nate Oates, the coach, um, after Tuesday's bond hearing that said the president of the university uh, and everyone came together to make a decision. That was actually the athletic, athletic director yeah. who went on a podcast with ESPN and made those statements. And now, and so that is where you start to get 
this convoluted circle of plausible deniability. Okay. And, and that is, that is definitely one of the layers that I think makes this such an indictment of the higher education process. So Alabama football, as everybody knows, is the most important um, program at the school and in the state, probably second would be Auburn football. Um, but the basketball program has been on the come up since Nate Oates got there. They've had a really good program for the last few years, and this is their best team probably in program history. And, you know, I can imagine Joe is a a columnist who occasionally takes adversarial positions against the school and the program. There are a lot of things you write that don't have much of a constituency among the fan base of Alabama. Like, I, I know this from following LSU sports. Like, if a columnist or reporter does, like, a good story about something that makes the school look bad, the fans get mad at the columnist or at the at the reporter. And so I'm wondering, you know, what the response is that you've gotten to these pieces saying that Alabama is amoral, that the best player on the team and the best player in program history should not be playing. Um, what kind of response have you gotten in the community? Well, in the entire context of the state of Alabama, it is split down the middle between Alabama and Auburn. So you can imagine the the way the comments uh, directed towards me as the columnist in the state have gone. You know, it's pretty much down the, the color line of crimson and white and orange and blue. And those are Auburn's colors. So, um, yeah, visceral reactions and... I get a lot of hate mail, death threats, <laughs> you know, SEC football and it is a different thing, okay? And a lot of the times when people email me, they're really just frustrated with their programs and they're taking it out on me, the person who's reporting what is happening. And I can appreciate that as a columnist. I mean, that's just part of the gig. Do you think this would have been an easier decision for Alabama if um, they were, you know, eight and twenty? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, I would think so. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not a high bar, really. You wouldn't think to discipline a player when when it needs to happen, and this is definitely beyond that point. So, New Mexico State basketball program um, was canceled this year because of a couple of incidents. There was a shooting. Um, where a player on the team um, shot and killed someone. It was reportedly in self-defense, so there wasn't any charge there. Then there was an entirely separate incident where three players were accused of hazing, basically sexual assault on another player. And I'm not saying that, I mean, that that school seems to have had a bunch of different missteps uh, as well. But when all of this came out, they just canceled the entire season. And New Mexico State, I mean, people might think that's like uh, New Mexico State. I mean, they have like a really strong tradition of basketball. Like they've won NCAA tournament games historically and as recently as last year. I mean, Stefan, I don't know if you think that that's a comp and it shows that like you could cancel an, an entire season if you want to. Or do you think that those are different? Yeah, I mean, they, they actually canceled a game immediately after the incident happened and then canceled another game after that, after the shooting occurred, and this was back uh, last winter, um, and then when the allegations of hazing came to light involving several players on the team, hazing another player on the team, that's when they made the decision to cancel the entire season. I mean, there were different circumstances there, too. There, was, there were indications that after the shooting, assisting coaches sort of took possession of the player who was involved of his phone and his laptop and the gun. Um, so there was police involvement in the program immediately. But it, it, it wouldn't have been beyond the pale to, to imagine the school playing those games or continuing and saying everything's being investigated, but there are players who are not implicated and we want to make sure that they get the chance to do what they're here for to play basketball. And they chose not to do that. The stakes are higher right now, Joe, at Alabama with a potential, you know, top seed in the tournament, a potential lottery pick. Um, and the, 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 those, the, these things shouldn't be, I, we think, difficult. And yet inside programs, there are a lot of issues that bubble up. Um, and you can see where athletic administrators 
may try to rationalize continuing to play. I mean, do you feel that a, a sort of team-wide pause similar to New Mexico State could have occurred here? Or was that not even something that, that has come up? No way. Listen, in 2020, when there was a pandemic, there was no way that the SEC was not going to play football, okay? And the reason is because financially. I mean, that's the biggest reason. Sure. I'm not completely familiar with New Mexico State, but I know that wasn't the first game that was canceled against rival New Mexico and it was supposed to be sold out. Yep. So that's a lot of money on the table they left. It's way more money right now in Alabama is at stake. Every game is... They're packing out Coleman Coliseum. On Wednesday is the final home game of the season against Auburn. So you can imagine how much revenue will be gained from that. Uh, I mean, they're charging like $15 for cheeseburgers in the basketball arena right now. Okay. And then it's even more money if you can make it to the final four. We forgot to mention maybe the craziest fact in all of this, which is the NATO. It's called Ray Lewis immediately. After um, the news came down, Ray Lewis, who was obviously accused of being involved in a murder, not convicted, ended up testifying against people in that murder trial. But NATO, it's, you know, (laughs) he was kind of didn't have much of a national profile. I mean, he was like sitting next to Nick Saban, not saying much of anything when Nick Saban was on stage saying Jimbo Fisher was buying players. Like that's kind of the (laughs) the last time that Nate Oates was, at least for me, in the national consciousness. But he has really not covered himself in glory and just kind of shown, I mean, what coach would necessarily be prepared to deal with something like this? But it's hard to imagine someone, if out of ignorance or unpreparedness or something more malevolent, I don't know. It's like hard to imagine someone like behaving so dumbly in like repeated ways here. And so I don't know if you think it's like harmed his reputation. Is it revealed something about him that you didn't know before? Or are we kind of judging him too harshly because this is just a crazy circumstance that no coach is prepared to deal with? Well, I would say certainly he is not trained to talk about capital murder okay, as a basketball coach. Now, his background, okay, to this point was a wildly successful one. He was a math teacher at Romulus High School in the Detroit, Michigan area, okay, and then he, he got a chance to go coach at Buffalo. He was an assistant coach at Buffalo. Then he was named the head coach. He had some big upsets in the NCAA tournament. Greg Byrne, the athletic director, kind of hired him as this diamond in the rough and brought him to Tuscaloosa. And he was number one uh, in the SEC in 2020. They made it to the Sweet 16, lost to UCLA, and now he has this team with this amazing player. And so this is his first time really on the national stage, okay? It's not like it's John Calipari, who was great at UMass, great at Memphis, coaching the NBA, and now he's at Kentucky. Like, this is Nate Oates. He was a math teacher. And so now he is in front of the microphone, and he's having to talk about capital murder. So me, as a columnist, I take all that into consideration, that he's not going to say probably the best stuff right now. you know. And he's also just a very candid person when he speaks. But everything that he said on that Tuesday was completely just, it was hurtful for the family. And that's the biggest thing that I've tried to make the point of, because... At the beginning, and this is what the stepfather of Jamia Harris said to me. He said, at the beginning of all this, we really didn't understand why Nate Oates would come out and say that he, that he contacted Ray Lewis. Like, why would you contact Ray Lewis? But then on the Tuesday, when it came out that Brandon Miller was involved, the stepfather, Kelvin Hurd, said, okay, this makes sense to me because Ray Lewis was involved in a murder and he and he testified against two of his friends. And so why would you contact Ray Lewis? Well, it's maybe it's because you got this star basketball player, okay? And you need to follow the correct steps here. And so for the family, knowing all of this backstory and context, when NATO said those things, it really just devastated them. 
And for anyone who's lost someone, especially a young person in their lives, you know that it is just a minute to minute struggle. But on top of all of this stress, it's unimaginable grief for that family. Yeah, and and I wanted to bring it back to that. I will mention that the connection between Ray Lewis and Alabama is that one of Ray Lewis's kids went to Alabama, right? But you wrote a, a, a very moving column where you interviewed Kelvin Hurd, the stepfather, and you mentioned in it sort of in passing, Joe, that you could relate because you yourself lost a child. You wrote in the piece that you talked for about an hour and you were ripped up inside so much that I was too mentally exhausted to write this column immediately after our conversation. Um, that must have been a very difficult hour for both of you and for Kelvin Hurd to share what he shared with you must have been very difficult. But the point you keep coming back to, and I think it influences all of your reporting on this, is that people are forgetting the victim here, as so often happens when celebrities, famous people, athletes, are involved in incidents like these. Yeah, you're right. It was a really difficult conversation for us to have. The first time when I talked to Kelvin Hurd, it was about an hour long, and it was as if it was therapy for him to get all of this out and just to talk with somebody from the heart. Losing my son, I can absolutely relate to that. And so I think that has definitely helped with, you know, empathy when reporting on, on this high profile case that involves a star player of a basketball team. There are a lot of people, their lives are shattered right now. Joseph Goodman is the lead sports columnist for AL.com. We'll link to his columns in our show notes. Joe, thank you so much. Thank you. Up next, Jeremy Wu on his Sports Illustrated cover story about Victor Wembanyama. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Other credit cards often charge annual fees for access to perks you might not even use or that can come with restrictions. Apple Card gives you valuable benefits without annual fees. In fact, there's not a single fee at all. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.24% to 26.24% based on credit worthiness. Rates as of January 1st, 2023. When we recorded this segment last Friday, the Houston Rockets, San Antonio Spurs, and Detroit Pistons collectively had lost their last 25 games. Three for Detroit, seven for Houston, 15 for San Antonio. Fans might be fine with the losing continuing until their teams clinch one of the three worst records in the NBA and the best odds for the number one pick in the league's draft lottery in May. The team's owners seem fine with it, too. Here's the Rockets' Tillman Fertitta giving away the game to a Houston TV reporter during a Mardi Gras event in Galveston, Texas last week. Okay, well, I know we're not going to talk business, so I'll just say, go Rockets. Hey, absolutely. <laughs> we, we got, thank God we got 10 days off. <laughs> Thanks so Pray much. for Victor. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. Victor is, of course, Victor Wembanyama, the seven-foot-plus French teenager who entered the American basketball consciousness during two games in Las Vegas in October and is considered the best NBA prospect since LeBron. Jeremy Wu traveled to France for his Sports Illustrated cover story inside Victor Wembanyama's plan to dominate the NBA like never before, which everybody should check out. And Jeremy Wu is here now. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I should note here that Jeremy was among 17 people laid off by SI earlier this month. Uh, Someone should hire him. Hope you're doing okay, Jeremy. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, so back to Victor. Webunyama is such a lock for the number one pick that he justifiably could have sat out the season to avoid risking injury. Instead, he's averaging 20-plus points for his French team, Metropolitans 92, and last week in just his third senior national team appearance had 22 points, 17 rebounds, six blocks, four steals, and an assist in only 29 minutes in a World Cup qualifier against the Czech Republic. You wrote in your SI piece, his last year in France is a platform to work on his craft. You portray an athlete with enormous self-confidence who also knows that he isn't a finished product yet, which is, I found, really kind of interesting. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. It was an interesting assignment, being that you know he already was pretty high profile, and B, uh, you know there hasn't been a ton of coverage. He hasn't done a ton of interviews yet, so you know getting to be one of the first people. I don't know if I was the first, but one of the first people to to go over there and really get a little bit of time with him. Uh, and sort of learn about, you know, his personality. I mean, um, de- definitely, I think you kind of hit it. Like, there's a mixture of, uh, you know, confidence and humility. And his English is amazing for someone who's been to the U.S. twice and is, you know, not a native speaker. So, you know, we had a great a great conversation. And I think, you know, I was just impressed with him because, you know, I've interviewed in my career a lot of, you know, 18, 19-year-olds, uh, you know, here in the States. And uh, he was more comfortable, you know, <laughs> doing this interview in his second language than, a lot of kids are so um, a very impressive person to, to sort of interact with and, and, and get to meet for the first time. How tall are you, Jeremy? <laughs> I am. Uh, I would say in shoes, I'm uh, a little over six feet. <laughs> so, in watching the kind of behind the scenes video that SI put out alongside your cover story, the thing that really stands out, and forgive me for the banality of this comment, is that this guy is extremely tall, and even. <laughs> If he were not one of the most gifted basketball players in the world, there's something about moving through the world being that height that makes you the center of everyone's attention. There's like shots of little kids just like being completely in awe and like not understanding what it is they're even looking at. And even alongside somebody like you who's like above average height, I mean, it is just absolutely absurd how large this guy is. Can you kind of put that into context for us a little bit? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. You know, I talked to, you know, some former and current NBA players who are also very tall, who are French, uh, you know, Rudy Gobert and Jan Mahimi, who is retired now. Um, But, you know, that's one thing they kind of echoed just in our conversations. And not all of it made it into the story, but kind of the gist of the idea here is that when you're when you are that tall, you know, it's 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 you do stand out. And, you know, building that type of confidence is not easy uh, when you're young. So the balance that he's kind of found in his life is kind of already pretty unique whether or not he were an elite athlete, <laughs> it's, it's uncommon. And and it's funny, like one of the earliest things I think I learned, uh, you know, covering, <laughs> covering basketball is like, you never want to play up the fact that, oh, this basketball player is tall because they're all tall, like factually, <laughs> but for the most part, but he is very tall. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it's the NBA, I think posted some footage from, you know, the, I think when they were over there for the, the Paris game in, in January and they put a GoPro on him and kind of like, basically walking around their stadium and shooting and dunking and like you could just see everything from his height uh, and it was very unique uh another you know funny story that didn't make it into the piece his agent told me one of the coaches uh told him that uh one day like before practice one of the coaches like pulled a ladder and put it on the court like under the basket and stood on it just to like be victor's height uh and just sort of see what it looked like up there to like you know get a sense of how different it is and, and it is and that's something that you know, Victor also touched on, you know, I think basically the not the exact quote, but the idea here is that it's a different sport when you're when you're that tall versus, you know, being, you know, six foot two, six foot three. It's just a different game. There are different angles. You see different things. Right. And what he says after he tells you that is that, um, you know, the way I want to play, I got to innovate and just create new things. And the thing about Victor is that what we've seen is that he can handle like a point guard. He takes crazy three point shots, many of which go in. Um, and he can also play in the paint like a more traditional big man. Um, but he's also right now pretty skinny. And again, seven foot two or three or four, however tall he actually turns out to be. Players can look thin and when they get to the NBA can be sort of uh, recast as too light and we need to bulk this guy up. But one of the things that his trainer told you and his coaches told you is that, and his agent told you is that we don't want to do this yet. We don't want this guy to like put on 30 pounds right now. We want it to become more gradual. Um, is there concern that like an NBA team will try to change him or has he been managed so carefully that that's likely to continue once he gets to the league? Well, I think the injury discussion, you know, it's such an easy point to make, um, you know, whether or not you're someone who really follows basketball or sports, you know, you just see a really tall, skinny guy and you know that he's going to, you know, playing against much stronger guys. I think it's something people are going to bring up. But, you know, f- from my perspective and from, you know, my understanding of the situation, yeah, they don't want to put that, that, that heavy weight on him. And I'm kind of in the camp where I, I sort of agree. I tend to agree with that. You know, A, just from injury prevention standpoint, yeah, you can make the point, well, you know, he's going to need to be stronger in order to take hits from other players. 
But if you think just the physics of, you know, being that tall and stress injuries, you know, the history of, you know, foot and ankle and, you know, stress related injuries in, in really tall people, uh, particularly basketball players, you know, those injuries are really tough to recover from. And some of it has to do with being so heavy and putting so much stress on your body and, and your feet in particular from striking the ground all the time. Right. So, you know, they're very aware of managing, you know, not so much his minutes, but just his workload. Like, I think that was part of the reason he chose to. Uh, not play in the uh, on a Euroleague team this year. They switched clubs. Um, you know the Euroleague plays a separate schedule from uh, the French league, and it's you're playing an extra game a week, and there's a lot of you know uh, international travel and uh, you know flying around, uh, connecting flights in Europe, etc. So like they're very conscious of um, you know trying to take care of his body, trying to do this the right way, and ultimately I think that you know to your point about you know will a team try to change him? Well, I think Victor is so so talented and unique that. You know, I think they'll have, I think, a little bit of leverage in those conversations with teams, too. Well, you know, we want to do it this way. And I think, you know, you kind of got to, you know, trust uh, trust him and, and how he feels about his body. Because, uh, you know, the last point is that, um, you know, when you put on a lot of muscle, it changes the way you move. Uh, it changes, uh, you know, how fluid you are. Um, you know, a lot of things can change just whether or not you're an athlete. You know, you change your body. Uh, there's things you can't predict uh, that uh, in terms of how it affects your your movement. And. You know, for someone who is as tall as he is with um, such an incredible level of motor skills like he has, like, I don't know why you'd mess with it. Um, you know, and you watch the things he can do, you know, with the ball. And, uh, you know, I think it's it's a give and take. And it's something that we haven't seen before. So people are going to have questions. But ultimately, I, I'm in the camp that I, I think it's better to just kind of let him be skinny. Because uh, he's going to be, I think, more on the perimeter than on the inside most of the time. So... Coming to Las Vegas um, for the games against G League Ignite and uh, Scoot Henderson was part of the media rollout um, for him. And then having you and also there was an ESPN profile that came out um, this week was another part of the strategy. Um, He is an extremely marketable guy, not just because he's very good at basketball, but he's an attractive young man, charming, speaks uh, English very well, as you said. Um, can you give us a little bit of kind of behind the scenes insight based on your experience kind of with him and with the agents and handlers about kind of how they are handling this introduction of him to the world? Because it does seem very kind of coordinated and systematized and thought out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I don't want to speak directly for anybody, but the, I think the gist um, you know, kind of, the, of, of their, their plan here. And, and as you can sort of see by how, how they're handling it, um, I think they're, they're being very targeted and very careful about, you know, how much attention and how much, you know, how, how busy he needs to be with these things already. You know, I think it's a lot for a teenager, no matter who you are, just being famous in general. They've been cognizant of that. The, the whole, you know, the exhibitions with Ignite, I think were, you know, partially just to kind of establish that, you know, he was willing to play anybody and you know, he played amazing both games. You know, I was there. It was my first time getting to see him play. Um, I think it was smart. You know, a lot of people got to see him play for the first time. And then the more you start to do these things and see these things, and then he goes back over to France and he's playing his full schedule. He hasn't gotten hurt. He's playing the games and you see the numbers are what they are. And, you know, it's a lot of room to grow. But, you know, we're not talking about someone who's an idea, right? I mean, this is somebody who's a professional. Uh, and who's doing things at a very high level that uh, I think, you know, scouts will tell you a lot of these things translate really well to the NBA uh, right away. Uh, so as far as the media rollout, yeah, I mean, I don't think uh, they're letting him speak to just anybody. You know, they, they're you know, being careful about, you know, what he does. And again, as soon as he gets here, the level of chaos is going to triple, <laughs> if not more. So as much as you can do to sort of straddle, like helping this guy become marketable, um, but also, you know, help, allowing him to kind of have a life and kind of pace out this transition into being, you know, what likely a global superstar, um, you know, you know, letting him have that time, I think is, is valuable. And, and it sounds like from your profile and from the ESPN piece that, you know, it's a different system in Europe, right? He left his home you know, about, I guess he grew up like a half hour, 45 minutes from Paris, but he left when he was 14, to basically play basketball full time. Um, he's been much more of an adult. And you spent a lot of time in your piece talking about his intelligence. Um, you know, some of that is just like he is, sounds like he'd be pretty good at Learned League. He's got a lot of facts stuffed in his head. Um, he played Trivial Pursuit when he was little. 
But Rudy Gobert and other basketball people also talk about his sort of thirst for knowledge and also his ability to take what he's learned from coaches and apply it like almost immediately and not forget it. He's got that high IQ. Yeah, totally. I think at the end of the day, like, look, you know, there are a lot of, there have been a lot of these stories over the years about various young players who are in the next whatever, right? But I think part of what gives people confidence in Victor, as you kind of get to know him and, and you understand sort of how he thinks, I don't think this is somebody who's going to be satisfied or somebody who's going to you know get to the NBA and uh, plateau, right? Like we see a lot of players uh, for various reasons, right? Like guys, you know, he's not hit a wall developmentally or, or distractions get in the way. You know, he's somebody who, again, has very high goals for himself. You know, he's ambitious um, and he's competitive and I think he cares about the right stuff. So like, I don't fear him coming to the NBA and suddenly, you know, changing, you know, who he is. Were you mad that ESPN got the detail about his big toe exercises? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. No, I haven't. I haven't even read that whole that whole story yet. I, I, it was pretty good, but I, I didn't. I, I haven't gotten time to read the whole thing. So I'm looking at his stats now for his French team, and just based on like watching the highlights and watching the games. In Vegas, you would think he's like shooting 40% from three. He's shooting 29% from three. I'm not trying to nitpick like the guy who's the greatest uh, prospect in the history of the world, but let's nitpick the greatest prospect in the history of the world. What are the things that either he needs to work on or that he is working on? And, you know, it's not probably going to be a situation where he comes in and dominates in the NBA, right? I would imagine that there is going to be a kind of growth curve and a learning curve for him, although I'm sure he'll just block a crap ton of shots right away. I honestly, I think he's going to be pretty good right away. Yes, there's always a learning curve for everybody, but this guy is ready in a lot of ways that a lot of (laughs) players are not. You know, to the point with the shooting, yeah, like, I think any young player who's playing at a a pro level, we still have to grade Victor on that curve where it's like, yeah, he's only shooting 29, but you see the difficulty of the shots he makes and the way he takes them, and, you know, that's something that projects to get better. Like, he has the touch. Like, uh, that was something that impressed me, you know, seeing him play for the first time. Obviously, he hit six threes and he hadn't done that before. But, like, I think he's still kind of scratching the surface in some ways. And the shooting is one of them, right? So his shot blocking, I think, will, will translate right away as well. You know, as we talked about, like, the physicality is one thing. Like, he, he already gets hit a lot <laughs> in France. And, you know, they already don't really have – they already kind of have a hard time officiating him because uh, you can't call everything and people are going to hit him. But he's also pretty tough. Like, I think he knows that. He's going to get that. But I think, yeah, dealing with that, uh, I think anytime you're a guy with kind of a high center of gravity, you know, learning to sort of navigate playing in traffic in the NBA where it's often there's crowds and, uh, you know, bigger guys and stronger guys who are, you know, the best players in the world. Yeah, I mean, it's there's an adjustment. But, um, again, he's so tall. His anticipation defensively is really good. You know, I think some of the offense he creates, he'll be able to create it right away because he can just shoot over people, right? I mean, it's not like he has to go to incredible lengths to, like, get a good shot for himself. It is funny that he's like working on all this stuff with like sidestepping and like the one leg fadeaways and stuff. It's just like, just stand still and shoot over everyone. <laughs> right. But, you know, that kind of goes back to the point of like, hey, if you can, if, you, if he can be a really, really tall finesse player who makes these shots, it, it limits the, um, the type of, bo- you know, hits his body's going to take. Right. So, you know, it all kind of goes in concert. Um, it's just, it's always difficult to rationalize because, again, we've never seen a guy, you know, Durant, Kevin Durant is probably the offensively, you know, the closest thing we've seen. Uh, to how Victor wants to play, but it's it's unique into itself. And, you know, Giannis was another 19-year-old European who came and was really skinny and changed his body type and changed his game. I mean, really couldn't shoot well at all in his first three seasons from outside the paint. Um, didn't average 20 points a game until his fourth year in the league. So there's room for growth, but there's also going to be more room for people to criticize because Giannis wasn't expected to have a gigantic impact on the league when he uh, arrived initially. I guess with uh, the one thing we haven't talked about is is the draft lottery itself. Does it matter where he ends up? Um, you know, the the tanking, as I as I uh, alluded to in my intro, seems pretty solid right now. We know who the top three likely picks. I think Charlotte could sneak in there with a, a number. You know, they're right fourth now. They could squeeze in. And get the highest odds to get uh, Victor, but does it? Does do you think it matters? He says it doesn't matter where he ends up. Do you think it matters? I mean, everything matters, but at some point, like when you're as talented as he is, like you know, wherever he goes, they're gonna have to figure out how to make it work. And, and so, you know, obviously, like we can kind of argue this any number of ways, like what type of market he should play in or what type of teammates. You know, there, there's all these different ways you can kind of rationalize it. But I, 
I think as long as he goes somewhere uh, with a coach that he trusts and who understands him, you know, I, I think I think it'll go just fine. He's, he's just he's so talented that I think you kind of have to try to play through him. You have to let him play this this way with you know making these tough shots and because uh, that's where the upside is, right? Like you're not going to park him, <laughs> you're not going to tell him to play center. You know, you're not going to tell him to play. <laughs> you know, what's not his real position? You know, just he's the number one pick, right? So like we know that those guys have a little bit of leverage uh, in these situations, and I think I think wherever he goes. You know, it'll spark some change, but, uh, you know, presumably in a good way. So, any final kind of story um, that you're going to take away from your time with him? And I guess, were you kind of conscious of the fact that sort of like the, you know, late Grant Wall writing the first cover story about LeBron, that you were kind of on an assignment that would have some kind of historic import and, and value? Yeah. I mean, it was definitely on my mind, honestly. Like, you know, I knew Grant. Um, you know, we we sat pretty close to each other back when SI had an office. Uh, I didn't know him super well, but he was always uh, very kind to everybody. And, uh, you know, I regret, uh, you know, when I was sort of starting the reporting, I, I regret not calling him. Uh, I wanted to call him and just never really, never did uh, to sort of ask about this. But um, as a as a kid, uh, I think one of the first, maybe the first Sports Illustrated that I remember getting is that LeBron issue that with that story he wrote. You know, I'm 30, so this is probably, I it must have been like, I guess that was what? 20 years ago, yeah. So yeah, like, de- definitely something that, you know, I read and, you know, there's a, a, a slight nod to, to that story in, in my story, uh, which is intentional. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's unique and it's sort of a dream assignment to sort of, you know, get to do this, uh, with, with someone who, uh, you know, seems to sort of check all the boxes in, in such a uh, unique and special way. And I'm just excited to sort of see where his career goes. Yeah, I, t- I told them, you know, if he somehow ends up on the Bulls, you know, I live in Chicago. I told him I'd buy a condo and just, just <laughs> stay stay forever. So I, I think, you know, wherever he goes, they're going to make the best of it. Jeremy Wu wrote this Sports Illustrated cover story inside Victor Webanyama's plan to dominate the NBA like never before. We will post a link to it on our show page. Jeremy, good luck and thank you for coming on the show. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Coming up next, we'll talk with CNBC media reporter Alex Sherman about the impending death of regional sports networks and the future of sports on television. Time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Other credit cards often charge annual fees for access to perks you might not even use or that can come with restrictions. Apple Card gives you valuable benefits without annual fees. In fact, there's not a single fee at all. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.24% to 26.24% based on credit worthiness. Rates as of January 1st, 2023. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. You might not have heard of Diamond Sports Group, but you've probably seen its products. Diamond is a subsidiary of Sinclair Broadcast Group, and it has a portfolio of 19 regional sports networks, which are branded as Bally Sports. Between them, those networks have the local broadcast rights for 47 NBA, WNBA, NHL, and Major League Baseball teams. Among them, the Miami Heat, the Phoenix Suns and Mercury, the LA Kings, the Atlanta Braves, and a whole lot more. Earlier this month, Diamond missed about $140 million in interest payments. I'm not what you'd call a business guy, but skipping out on $140 million in payments is probably not a good business thing. And lo and behold, there have been a bunch of reports that Diamond will likely file for bankruptcy protection. Joining us now is one of the journalists who's breaking news on this beat, CNBC media reporter Alex Sherman. Great to have you here, Alex. Happy to be here, Josh. 
So we've had this news about Diamond this week. Why don't you zoom out? Just tell us your views on what's been happening with them and what the bigger story is here. Right. So what we're seeing now is sort of the beginning of the crumbling of the iceberg of regional sports networks as an industry. Regional sports networks are owned by a variety of different companies. Uh, Comcast owns a bunch. Uh, Diamond Sports Group owns a bunch. The, the ones that Diamond acquired were actually uh, part of Fox's deal when they sold the majority of its assets to Disney. Uh, those regional sports networks were then kicked aside in that deal uh, and eventually acquired by Sinclair. So these have sort of been through the ringer now of Fox to Disney and now owned by Sinclair. For $10.6 billion. Seems like a bad, uh, bad deal. <laughs> Honestly, a lot of people said this was a terrible deal the moment it was inked. I remember talking to people at Comcast about the deal. And Comcast was like, not only do we not want these regional sports networks, uh, at least these are some people internally, I won't reveal exactly who said it, but some people were like, we don't even want the ones we own. Like, you know, this this There was business. confusion in the industry akin to the confusion when like the Timberwolves traded all those draft picks for Rudy Gobert. It's like, what are <laughs> yeah. what are they doing at the, at the time? People are like, what are you doing? Right, exactly. And, and then the writing on the wall that probably history is just going to make this deal look worse and worse. That was the similar situation here uh, to, to the Sinclair deal. And, and so why? why? Why was this such a bad deal? Well, this deal came years into a multi-year decline of linear pay TV, the cable bundle. So that peaked in, let's say, 2012 with about 100 million U.S. households subscribing to traditional cable TV. That number is now down around 70 million, give or take. So millions of Americans have been canceling cable TV every single year. And the way the regional sports network business is structured is that these various channels are baked into your standard cable bundle. Uh, so whether or not you watch, you are paying four to, let's say, eight dollars a month for local sports. That is a great deal for people that love local sports, but there are tens of millions of people that do not watch local sports at all, and they are paying 4 to $8 per month every month to subsidize everybody who watches, in essence. So what happened here was that the pay TV carrier started to catch on to this, and they started to push back on the carriers of these regional sports networks, and Diamond Sports Group, uh, was sort of caught in the crosshairs here. First, it was Dish, which you know has more than 10 million uh, uh, pay TV subscribers nationally. Dish said, no mas, we're not going to pay for you. And by not paying for you, we're going to be able to lower the, the, the rising cost of cable and potentially keep around maybe millions of subscribers uh, who are pushing back on us by canceling outright because their bills are too expensive. And, you know, various different pay TV providers followed suit around the country, whether it was Comcast or DirecTV or even some of the digital bundlers of linear networks like YouTube TV, Hulu with live TV, even Fubo, which advertises itself as a sports first uh, digital carrier of networks. Even Fubo didn't pick up Diamond Sports Group. Uh, because they just felt like these networks were so expensive, they were going to push the price of the overall bundle to a place where not enough consumers would purchase it. It would be too expensive. So Diamond Sports Group is caught in the crosshairs because of this outrageous deal. It had to put $8 billion of debt on that $10.6 billion acquisition. So it had payments coming up that were due uh, in a way that made themselves more financially vulnerable than all of the other owners of regional sports networks. So that's why we've been talking about Diamond first here. They are uh, sort of the first crack in this iceberg here. And that's what we've learned, that they're preparing a restructuring, preparing a bankruptcy. And now they need to work not only with their bondholders who are due this money, but also the leagues themselves, because the leagues are paid by Diamond. That's sort of the, the work through here. The pay TV providers pay Diamond, and then the Diamond, Diamond Sports Group pays the leagues, meaning Major League Baseball, National Basketball Association, the NBA, and the NHL, 
uh, for the the rights to carry their program. And they pay the local teams too. And what's what's really shocking to me is how quickly this entire industry unraveled. I mean, I, I covered this stuff for the Wall Street Journal 20 years ago, less than 20 years ago, and RSNs were viewed as the savior for teams. This was the a huge chunk of local revenue that teams were able to generate that they would not have to share across the league. Teams were creating their own RSNs, their own channels, um, and charging fans, as you said, a good chunk of money via their carriers to watch their games. And this is partly, of course, due to streaming and its impacts in addition to cord cutting. Now, it it does look like this might be an opportunity for the leagues themselves to take back some of this business. Major League Baseball seems like it's all but salivating to get a hold of the local rights to its teams um, as a way to sell directly to fans in every market as opposed to fans having to go through the middleman of the regional sports network. Yeah, so let, let's put this in context, which is for a while, the regional sports network business was fantastic for all parties involved, um, the, the, the least of them being the actual pay TV provider. But even in that case, they were giving people the rights to these games and they were simply passing along the cost to consumers and consumers for many years was simply taking it. On the RSN front, the actual networks, they were making more and more and more money every year because they were jacking up their programming fees by 10 or 15 percent every single time they had one of these contract renewals come up. So they were living large. And of course, on the on the back end, the leagues or the local teams, like you said, the, the way these rights are done, the, the, the regional sports networks negotiate with the leagues themselves for the NBA and the NHL. Major League Baseball is separate where they actually do it from the teams. The teams on the right, not the league. Uh, but they were all making more and more money. So it worked out great, particularly for the sports teams. So this idea now that Major League Baseball wants its rights back, that is absolutely true. It seems to be true. But the reason they want their rights back now is they see in this new world – this doesn't work, including from the streaming side. If you think about it, the, the Diamond Sports Group solution here is that they want to charge $20 a month for you to be able to stream your local team. So Bally that's Plus. a lot more money. Bally Plus. That's a lot more money than you are paying for every other streaming service you own. Uh, uh, let's say a little to a lot more money, depending on which streaming service it is. But you get every single thing on Netflix – for less than $20 a month. So the pr- the price seems out of whack and you have to think about well, how many people are actually gonna pay this. So the reason Major League Baseball wants the rights back is they kind of realize that the RSN model in a streaming world doesn't work, it's broken. So if they can offer some sort of new thing where they control the rights and they can package it up uh, and, and maybe they can sell you, uh, you know, an in-market package or an out-of-market package or some sort of combination and they can slice it and dice it. It gives them a better fighting chance moving forward. That said, the RSN model in its previous iteration was probably the most lucrative model that Major League Baseball was going to get. So to some degree, they come into this reluctantly taking back the rights because there's a realization that maybe – the boom times are over here, and there's certainly no uh, certainty moving forward that this new streaming iteration, even if they own the rights, is going to make them more money than the old cable system did. So let's talk about the NBA. And as you said, there are some idiosyncrasies with the different leagues, but I think this is like fairly generalizable. The NBA has this thing called League Pass, and you can get it online, on your phone, whatever, on uh, on your uh, cable system as well. And that allows you to watch every out-of-market game and the local games are blacked out. So it doesn't help me, which I do not want to watch the Washington Wizards games, but it does not help me if here in DC I wanted to watch the Washington Wizards games. What could happen in the near future is that there could be an NBA league pass that includes the Wizards games for me or includes the local games for everyone. And that seems to be exactly what's happened with MLS which has this deal with Apple. It just kicked in um, this past weekend. I believe it's called Season Pass. And you just go on Apple TV Plus where you watch Ted Lasso or whatever else. And there's a little icon and you click through and you can watch any game you want. Um, What's the story with that 
deal? Is it that the MLS like produces all of the all of the games and provides the local announcers? Um, and is that a template that the other leagues are all looking at to partner with a streamer and just put everything available for everyone? Yeah, so I'll try to put a timeline around this. So in, what's about to happen here as, as Diamond Sports Group prepares for its bankruptcy? And we also, by the way, got some news uh, this week that Warner Brothers Discovery has informed uh, the professional sports teams that are tied up with its three regional sports networks that it, too, is planning to go bankrupt. So if these bankruptcies happen... The leagues now, or the local teams, are preparing contingency plans for what's going to happen to the programming if it, it's not airing on the, their, the regional sports networks that they thought it was going to air on. Now, in the, in the case of Diamond, it's possible that nothing changes here, even in a prepackaged bankruptcy, and that they figure out a way for these things to keep going. Um, but in the case of Warner Brothers Discovery, they want out of the business. So those games are going to have to show up somewhere else. Uh, we don't know exactly what that may mean, but from what I gather, the leagues want these games to still air on linear TV because they realize that, particularly for older people, that's how they get their games. So they don't want a streaming-only solution here. But from the streaming standpoint, that's when we can turn and take a look longer term toward this Apple MLS deal. It just so happens, let's take the NBA for an example, it's not coincidence, that the local rights and the national rights all come up at the same time for the NBA. That's at the end of the 2024-25 season. So that gives the league a chance, if they want to do so, to follow this Apple MLS deal. And this deal, as you mentioned, allows Apple to stream all games, no local blackouts, uh, uh, through... Uh, an addition, you have to subscribe to Apple TV Plus and then you pay an additional amount of money to get this MLS package. Uh, and the NBA would probably do a similar thing, uh, it, whether with Apple or anyone else. Uh, they could also do it themselves if they wanted to. But the general idea would be they would get rid of these sort of what they consider to be, I think, arcane local blackout rules now that no longer uh, apply to a streaming world. And so you would pay your X amount of money per month similar to NFL Sunday Ticket or League Pass already today, but you would now include your local games. Uh, and yeah, the, the, the production behind those games, I think, um, would have to be worked out to some degree. I think that's still an unknown. Uh, they could do it themselves um, or, or they could use existing producers of games and sort of include them in the revenue share to some degree. In other words, theoretically, you could, you could ask NBC or Warner Brothers Discovery Turner to produce these games and use them and, and cut them in on the deal. So I don't know exactly how that will work. But yeah, the end product would be something that does not exist today. It would be a streaming service that would include all games. And that is the template for Apple and the MLS. And by the way, that is a global product, not just in, in the United States. That was one of the reasons why Apple didn't get the rights to NFL Sunday Ticket, which were just uh, auctioned off a few months ago. YouTube TV ended up with those rights, but this was something that I reported on a few months ago. Apple wanted the global rights to Sunday Ticket, uh, and they also wanted no local blackouts. But the NFL already has existing contractual deals and basically said to Apple, like, we're, we're not going to rip that up. We can't rip that up. We're not going to get sued. And so Apple ultimately walked away from Sunday Ticket. Do you envision more of the streaming services moving into sports? There's been some reluctance for one of the reasons you just articulated that you don't have worldwide rights. Um, so from the league's perspective, they're looking to find a way to replace the revenue losses from the decline of tethered cable um, and regional sports networks. From a provider's perspective, there's got to be money in this to make it worth paying Major League Baseball or the NFL or the NBA multiple billions of dollars. Um, you know, if Major League Soccer is worth two and a half billion over 10 years, what's the NFL worth? What's Major League Baseball worth for Major League Baseball, particularly with so much more inventory? So how do you envision the approach from the streaming services sort of dipping their toes uh, or, or jumping all in to sports? This is a great question. It is the unknown question. So from the streaming services provider, you have to figure that they will think about what happened to the cable model 
and make sure that they don't recreate that. In other words, if you pay a lot of money for sports and then you just throw that into the streaming service, you're ending up with the same problem you, you, you were in with the cable bundle, which is everyone's going to be paying for sports, but not everyone's going to be watching it. So perhaps you end up with a more similar situation to Europe historically, which has always had a tiered service. So unlike the U.S., where you were paying for regional sports networks, whether or not you were watching them, because they were all baked into your standard cable bundle. This system still exists today, by and large. In Europe, there's always been a tiered system where if you wanted local sports, you had to pay more money than your standard cable subscriber. So if sports do go into the major streaming services, Netflix and Max, the combination of HBO Max and Discovery and Peacock and whatever else exists years down the road, uh, I think there may be some sort of tiered model there where you have to pay more money to get access to the live sports. The other way this could go is that the leagues, by and large, develop their own products. The NFL announced a few months ago that they have developed NFL Plus. Many people assume this is just a precursor for the NFL to take back some of their rights seven years down the road or whatever it may be, five to seven years uh, based on the, the out clauses in that contract. So it's possible if the leagues take back all their rights, we may end up in a streaming situation where sports is by and large segregated from the large streaming services. So you've got your Netflix and your Amazon Prime and your Disney Plus and Hulu. Those become general entertainment products. And then to get sports, you need to but pay separately for ESPN Plus or one of these league packages. And that's how we move forward. I could see that happening as well. Yeah, the NFL's on Amazon now. We just have U.S. women's national team soccer debut on HBO Max. Um, we obviously have Premier League games on Peacock. Um, it just seems like everybody is kind of experimenting, um, trying to figure out what works and doesn't work. And my final thought on Bally is just like as somebody who follows the New Orleans Pelicans, cannot overstate how much people hate that brand name, that company, the whole Bally Plus thing. Just, I think, it feels like everyone at every level is ready for this to end. Um, and so <laughs> I don't think it'll necessarily be a soft landing for everyone. But, you know, as you've been saying, Alex, these are just like clearly the final days and um, we're all going to be like living in a different world very soon. But, you know, soft landing is not going to be a soft landing for fans either. If, you know, it's already, <laughs> you know, I subscribe to Peacock and ESPN Plus and Apple Plus and it's going to get more onerous for fans to acquire and watch games. Um, and that's But you're going to feel so much better because too. instead of one big bill, you're going to have a bunch of smaller bills that add up to more than the big bill, Stefan. So you'll feel better psychologically. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, big picture, I think the thing to watch for that I'm most interested in is actually what effect does this have because it's, this is a big cycle. Let's start with this. What effect does it have on the amount of media revenue that's coming in to the teams and the leagues. Because in, in, in the model that I just described to you as the possible second model here, where sports is by and large segregated from the big streaming services, that sets up a situation where only sports fans are watching sports by and large. Uh, that means the amount of people watching and paying is smaller than today. And that probably means that the amount of money paid for sports rights goes down, which is very dissimilar than what we are living in and what we have been living in for the past 20 years, where the, the, the idea that you would have a huge increase on sports rights was bankable because all these legacy media companies realized that sports were the one thing that was keeping the bundle alive, and they were making a lot of money and have been making a lot of money from the bundle. So if the bundle finally gets to the point where there's just no growth and there's sort of complete abandonment and nobody is watching TV that way anymore. Again, I'm talking about five, seven years down the road, most likely. Then we're in a world now where the sports teams are making less money and there's contraction and we're seeing salaries go down and maybe we're seeing uh, interest go down and now eyeballs are coming down. And that's sort of this like slow motion theoretical, I don't want to call it a death cycle because these sports are too ingrained in our society to say that they would ever be going away. But it is certainly possible 
that we are in the final days of a sports bubble that may be popping seven to 10 years from now. I will say this, having again covered this previously, the reports of the death of sports on television have been greatly exaggerated Everyone before. Says that, yeah. Sports, the leagues have been incredibly innovative in finding ways to extract more and more money from the people who watch their games. Yeah, whenever I bring up this argument to people that are in the sports business, that's always the rebuttal, which is like, yeah, I've heard that before. It never happens. But like we are going through now a fundamentally different thing because the way people are watching TV now is changing. So I do think that this idea that we're starting to see, maybe not the NFL, maybe the NFL is exempt, but at least we're starting to see contraction among all of the other sports, potentially NBA included down the road. Like, yeah, that, that, that seems at least plausible to me. Alex Sherman is a media reporter for CNBC. We'll be following his work on the death or survival of sports on television. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Josh. Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, host of Slate's Amicus Podcast, and I'm here to tell you that we have a special offer on Slate memberships. You can now get three months of Slate Plus for just $15, and you'll get no ads on any Slate podcasts, member-exclusive episodes and segments on my show Amicus, and shows like Political Gab Fest and Slow Burn, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. And best of all, you would be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism as we cover everything that is happening in the news every day. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcast plus. Again, that's three months for only $15. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. Now it is time for Afterball, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says, It was okay. Let's revisit Jeremy Wu's great Sports Illustrated cover story on Victor Wimbanyama, which includes this key passage about a coach who oversaw Victor's development as a child. That coach, it says, Kareem Bubakari, came of age playing street basketball in the 90s, equally inspired by and one mixtapes and NBA guard play. He came across a copy of Pistol Pete's Homework Basketball, a four VHS box set featuring Hall of Famer Pete Maravich that taught the fundamentals of dribbling and ball control using creative and unorthodox drills, which he cites as the foundation of his own coaching style. I am extremely familiar with Pistol Pete's homework basketball due to Pistol Pete Maravich's position as the great LSU basketball player, the great college basketball player of all time. Stefan, did you know that Pistol Pete's longstanding NCAA scoring record is now under threat? I did not. By whom? There is a player for Detroit Mercy. It is the coach uh, Mike Davis. You might remember the coach Mike Davis who led Indiana to, I believe, a national championship game, is now at Detroit. And his son, Antoine Davis, is like less than 70 points away. He has played five years, uh, whereas Pistol Pete <laughs> played when freshmen were ineligible. So he set the unbreakable, allegedly, scoring record in three years. And Antoine Davis has a couple games to try to score the 60-plus points he needs to break the record. But Pistol Pete's homework basketball, we're getting off subject. Barrett Swanson did an appreciation of it for the New York Times Magazine, a letter of recommendation back in 2017 that we'll link to in our uh, show notes, but he notes that the video furnished a bevy of drills whose names sounded like dance moves that you would execute only at a wedding. Different strokes, scrambled eggs, the laid back. Alone in the penumbral glow of the gym, Maravich pirouetted against the hardwood, schooling invisible foes with breakneck sleights of hand. Why don't we listen to uh, a clip from Pistol Pete's homework basketball? Scrambled eggs dribble. All those different parts. 
it'll scramble your brain for a while. You'll be very frustrated when you do it. But remember this, stay with it. Stay with that commitment. You can do it. Once you do it, you'll find yourself being able to come out on the court. You'll be able to set things up. You'll be able to take that ball and go any place you want with it because your hand will become an extension of it. That's a tremendous, creative, fundamental drill just for you. Did you own Pistol Pete's videos, Josh? I did not, but, you know, they've sort of osmosed into my mind as, as they do. I will say that one of the highlights of my basketball watching, sports watching uh, childhood was going to a game, a jazz game, in the Superdome and watching Pistol Pete Maravich. Why were you in New Orleans? Uh, visiting my uncle's family. I feel so close to you right now. I, mi I missed out on the whole New Orleans jazz scenario. I'm sorry I didn't stop by. Stefan, what is your Pistol Pete's homework basketball? Spring training games with baseball's new rules have begun. How's it going, you ask? It's going great. On Friday, the Padres' Manny Machado started to count 0-1 after he didn't get set in the batter's box with more than eight seconds on the new pitch clock. On Saturday, the Boston-Atlanta game ended on a pitch clock violation by an Atlanta hitter, Cal Conley, with a full count and the bases loaded. The cool thing was that no one was sure whether the violator was the hitter or the pitcher. But you have to break a few eggs, etc., and early data indicate that games are running about 20 minutes faster than last year's three-hour, six-minute average. Finally, you say, back to the halcyon days when no one complained about how long it takes to play a baseball game. Ha! Forget the last 40 years of whinging when game times increased 21% from two hours, 38 minutes in 1982 to a record 3.11 in 2022. Let's dial the clock back further. Game length actually increased even more in the post-war era, 23% from 2.07 in 1946 to 2.36 in 1965. So before the 1966 season, officials were concerned. To speed things along, baseball limited mound visits by managers. Times dropped a bit in the next few seasons, but most likely because it was a dominant era for pitchers. Wacky owner Charlie Finley was all four faster games. In 1965, he had his Kansas City Athletics borrow a, yes, 20-second pitch clock from the Amateur and Semi-Pro National Baseball Congress for a three-game series against the Yankees. The clock was visible to fans, but its buzzer was turned off and no ball strike penalties were assessed. 33 violations, however, were recorded. The idea is that Homer punchy pitchers have wasted unnecessary time between pitches, one columnist wrote in 1963, when MLB enlarged the strike zone, armpits to the top of the knees, to yes, speed up games. Now the reasoning goes they'll be more confident and work faster. All right, slow games were apparently plaguing college baseball, too. In 1962, Stanford's JV and freshman teams tried out some new rules during the preseason. No warm-up pitches between innings. No infield warm-up throws between innings. No tossing the ball around the horn after an out. Both teams had to run on and off the field or be docked a ball or strike. Pitchers got courtesy runners, and catchers did too if there were two outs so they could get their gear back on in a timely fashion. So that was 1962. 1955, MLB said that to enforce Section 804 of the official rules requiring the pitcher to throw within 20 seconds, a rule that had been in place for more than a quarter century, it turns out, the third base umpire would be equipped with a stopwatch. I found one mention of the stopwatch rule in newspapers.com during the season. Phillies pitcher Murray Dixon was assessed a ball for taking too much time. So I said the average game time in 1946 was 207. In just three years, it ballooned to 219, and retired slugger turned to GM Hank Greenberg called for the return of the two-hour game. League heads agree baseball too slow was the headline on an AP story in the Tampa Times in May of 1950, but they really couldn't agree on what to do or how to do it. Who is going to make a pitcher hurry up? When that is his bread and butter, NL President Ford Frick said, most of the bullpens are in center field. How are we going to get relief pitchers in? By Jeeps? 
Well, yeah, that's kind of what would happen. All right, back one more year to 1949 to hasten games. The Pacific Coast League restricted arguments between players and managers and umpires. Literally, like what you could argue about. You couldn't argue about balls and strikes or you get thrown out. 1933, the Charlotte News reported that fans at local ball games, to our certain knowledge, are complaining that the games keep them up too late at night and that have become so long as to become tiresome. All right, here's Damon Runyon in 1922. It takes an average of two hours to play a ball game. Fistic championships are generally decided in less time. A horse race involving hundreds of thousands of dollars is run off in a fraction of that time. There is much waste of motion in baseball, too much. The players move to and from their work slowly, and much of the game is a useless throwing of the ball. No lies there. But I think we can date concern trolling about baseball games being too long to 1911, when nine-inning games averaged an hour and 47 minutes. The games are becoming too slow, American League umpire Silk O'Laughlin was quoted as saying. He wanted to go back to the early days of the American League when, he said, games were frequently played in an hour and 15 minutes. In recent years, players have adopted slothful methods. His solutions, players should run to and from dugouts between innings. We saw that one later. Pitchers should spend less time licking their fingers to prepare to throw spitballs and also looking at signs. And hitters, most time is lost when batsmen can't find their own sticks. You'll see them handling every bat in the pile before their own is picked out. I would like to go back in time and invent the bat rack. All right, here's my prediction, Josh, a backlash to the two-hour and 40-minute baseball game and the rise of the slow baseball movement. This actually would be a good April Fool's Day story. My wife did something similar on NPR in 2011 about the slow internet movement and hipster cafes offering only dial-up service. Or it could be a real thing. Slow baseball. Savor it. So you could argue that the fact that the same complaints have been happening is, you know, an indication that people are just going to complain no matter what. You could also make the argument that the fact that they've been complaining about the same thing means that baseball games are too slow. Yes. <laughs> yes, you could. <laughs> just putting that out there. Forever. Like, since the game was invented, apparently. <laughs> that is our show for today. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. Listen to past shows and subscribe or just reach out. Go to slate.com slash hangup and you can email us at hangup at slate.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. For Stefan Fatsis, I'm Josh Levine. Remember Zelmo Beatty, and thanks for listening. Now it is time for our bonus segment for Slate Plus members. And it was a weekend of uh, buzzer beaters in basketball. Um, there were like true buzzer beaters, not the fake ones where there's like three seconds left. Um, Arizona State over Arizona, buzzer beater. Florida State over Miami, buzzer beater. Um, there's one that you watched on Sunday, Stefan. Yep. Iowa over Indiana, buzzer beater by Caitlin Clark. She knew it was money. That's what she said after the game. That was great. And then there was the... Almost, but would have been best buzzer beater by Joel Embiid um, against the Celtics on Saturday night. So this got me thinking, clearly proof of concept that the buzzer beater in basketball is one of the great plays in sports. I've got basketball, baseball, football, hockey, soccer, tennis, golf. Why don't we rank them one through seven for the greatness of the hypothetical greatest ending so in basketball, we have a bunch of recent examples. Let's take the Caitlin Clark one for example. So they're down, she gets the ball, releases it, they're losing, then they're winning, the crowd goes crazy, she runs uh, over to the stands, everybody's hype, last second buzzer beater. We all know what it looks like. In baseball, it would be maybe the the greatest ending would be like the Mariners over the Yankees, no offense, in 1995. Not like a walk-off home run, but like a walk-off right. hit into the gap where everyone's running around the bases right. and it a slide into It has to be decided home. at the very last second, right, at home plate. It can't be the walk-off homer where it goes out of the stadium and you still have to run around the, the bases. That's pretty great, too. But yeah, that's pretty good.
I feel like the greatest regular season ending in basketball is always going to be better than the greatest regular season ending in baseball. Like in baseball, it has to be in the playoffs. Do you agree or disagree? Yes, agree. Does it have to be in the World Series? No, no, I don't think so. So, like 1960, Bill Mazeroski. That was just a teaser of our Slate Plus segment this week. If you want the whole thing, not just this week, but every week, you need to be a member. Sign up at slate.com slash hangup plus. That's slate.com slash hangup plus.